Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow, every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem. Dairy producers in the United States are primarily paid for their milk based on the fat and protein concentrations shipped. In 2021, Dr. Kevin Harvatine joined us to discuss how seasonal and daily rhythms can impact component production. You can access uh, these recordings uh, at balchem.com slash real science. Today, we're pleased to welcome back Kevin uh, to discuss milk components and how to manage for both fat and protein production. Dr. Harvatine is an associate professor of nutritional physiology at Penn State University. He grew up on a dairy farm in Pennsylvania and received his BS in animal science from Penn State. He earned an, uh, his master's degree from Michigan State University and his PhD from Cornell University. His area of expertise is nutritional regulation of metabolism. Currently, Dr. Harvatine investigates milk fat depression, fat supplements, and daily patterns of intake and milk synthesis. His lab conducts uh, experiments ranging from applied dairy nutrition to mechanistic molecular biology experiments. He's authored or co-authored over 60 uh, peer-reviewed papers uh, since 2009 as in, and has spoken extensively at regional, national, and international conferences. Kevin, good to have you back. It's uh, the floor is now yours. It's great to be back. Uh, so today, really excited to to talk about uh, some different things than we're we're normally talking about. So, as a nutritionist, a lot of times when I'm talking, all my slides and in the whole talks about about nutrition, right? But what we're going to do today is actually step back and kind of broaden that and actually ask what is impacting fat and protein on the farm. And what I wanted to point out is that I know a lot of the audience is nutritionists and you're being paid to do the nutrition work, but I know you're doing a lot of other things on, on the farm. And we really need to think about the importance of those and not just the importance of those standing alone, but how important they are to having your diet perform to the best potential that it can perform to. So what I want to start out first is to talk about a few things that I think are really important right now that you want to keep in mind as we go here. The first is that with milk quotas and limits in parts of the country and increasing pricing of trucking, um, these are mostly based on milk pounds, right? So now there's actually extra value to watching fat and protein percent. The next thing is our high feed costs today. That makes feed efficiency much more important on our farms. And not just the cost of the feed, but also the performance that we're getting from that. So it's really important to optimize the response to nutrient. If you're buying an ingredient, buying a feed, you better make sure that it's doing what you want it to do in the diet and that you're not limiting the potential by something else that's going on. The next is dynamic milk fat and protein prices. You know, I, I always laugh because my main expertise is around milk fat. And as soon as milk protein gets just a couple cents more value than milk fat, I run into people saying, oh, I don't care about milk fat now because milk protein is, is worth more. Well, the reality is you, you, you can make both. I'll show you the data on that. And for optimal profitability, you need to be making, making both, right? So we need to think about profitability as the cost to make each component versus what we're selling that component for. And I think we can think of that from a marginal cost and profit standpoint. So, so if you are looking at that, I have this cow already, I'm making milk, milk fat or protein, whichever is the most valuable today. But then the other component, I still have the cow and she can do that also. And as long as it's profitable to make that component, we need to keep that, that in mind. Uh, the last is the long-term versus short-term decisions. So farms need to survive today. They need to be profitable today. But then we also need to make long-term decisions and kind of look in that crystal ball and say, how do we set up the farm for the most potential for profit and success 
a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And I think there's a lot of things that we can think of that may maximize profitability today, but if we lose reproductive performance or something like that, it could be really shooting ourselves in the foot in a year year from now. If we make the wrong decisions on genetics, that's gonna be hurting us five years down the road, right? So let's keep these in mind as we, we go through the discussion today. So I always like to start out talking about what, what's important to bringing dollars of cash flow to, to the farm. So you can look at fat and protein and other solids as dollars per pound, but we really need to look at this as dollars per cow per day because cows are always making probably 30 plus more percent milk fat than milk protein. So, so we, we have different yields, right? So this is just calculating out dollars per head per day for cow making 85 pounds of milk, 39 fat, 331 protein. And you can see most of the dollars coming back to the farm are fat and protein. If we look back over the last couple of years, protein spiked when we had a lot of the cheese buying during the pandemic. Now fat prices have been increasing, protein prices have been stabilizing. Uh, but again, we don't have to have a fight between fat fat, and protein. The, the takeaway from this is you're being paid for fat and protein. If we look at the other solids, there's not much value in those, those other solids. Uh, very, very low price. Now we have to make some of those because that's part of lactation, part of milk synthesis. We're gonna talk about that. But this is really costly that to make lactose, the cows to make glucose, that's a very energy demanding process. And actually, if we look at our metabolic disease and our diseases in early lactation, they really at the heart of them are a glucose deficiency, right? From, from all that lactose that's being made. So, so our, we really wanna keep our goal focused on maximizing fat plus protein yield. And now I've started adding in, I think we just can't think of the yields. I think we also want to beat average fat and protein concentration. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But if you think about if you're in a quota system, that's really important. If you have trucking costs, it's really important. But also just the expense of making that lactose. We, we, we want to kind of minimize that. So, so we want average fat and protein concentration and then keep the eye on the ball for fat and protein yield. So what is a, a 0.1 unit change in fat or protein worth? Well, it depends on the production level of the farm and on the price for those components. So at the top here, we're just looking at what's this 0.1 unit if it's 240 a pound. So that's about our five year average for these components. If we're making 80 pounds of milk, that's 20 cents per cow per day, $72 per year not a massive amount of money this is but this is a considerable amount of money especially considering it's on our margin and that could be going into our profit margin right what the value is dependent on the price of those components so just looking at that 80 pound cow going from two dollars to five dollars as those components go up the value increases so we want to kind of keep in mind what's the the the, the values of fat and protein in the markets and that can help us get the target. And then we can start looking at what is my budget to be able to get these increases? How much am I willing to invest based on that return that I'm gonna, going to expect? So I wanna turn and talk a little bit about the physiology of lactation and how, how the mammary gland works. And, and I, so I worked in my PhD with Dale Bauman and I always like this idea that he had of thinking of the mammary gland as a factory. And you can think of three assembly lines. You're making fat, protein, and lactose. When we turn on lactation, we turn all of these on, right? And there's a lot of coordinated regulation between these assembly lines. So we never see milk protein at zero. We never see it at 1%, right? Um, why is that? Well, the lactose synthesis is what's driving the fluid volume. That is the osmotic regulator. So the lactose goes into the lumen in the mammary gland, and then the water is pulled from the blood into the milk until it's osmotically equal to, to blood. So the amount of lactose that's being produced is driving the amount of volume, the pounds of milk that's there. But so how do we get such tight regulation between fat, protein, and, and lactose? Well, what it is is that the, the, when we turn on lactose synthesis, the regulation system also turns on fat and protein at the same time. So there's shared or coordinated regulation. 
we can't just turn one on without turning the others on. Now, we do have some differential regulation, and we'll talk about that, where we can turn fat and protein up and down a little bit relative to lactose synthesis. But, but in general, we're turning them all, all on. So you paid for pounds of components, but concentration gives you an idea of the mechanism of how you get a change in fat or protein yield. So what, what do I mean about this? So, so I, I, I um, really appreciate, we need to be looking at pounds, right? Because that's what we're being paid for. But I think we've actually gone a little bit too far in this that some people don't want to look at percents and they say percents are meaningless. No, we look at percents to actually understand what are the mechanisms at, at play. So if you look at, okay, my milk fat yield changed, the first thing I want to know is did milk fat percent change? Because that what that's going to tell me is if that increase in fat yield is driven by an increase in milk volume turning on everything, fat, protein, and lactose, or was it that I didn't change lactose, but I turned up fat synthesis, right? So that gives us an idea of what's actually going on in the mammary gland. It gives us an idea of what we're doing is specific for fat and protein regulation, or that's general stimulation of lactation. So some things drive, drive synthesis of all three pathways, all three assembly lines in the mammary gland, and that's okay, right? So a rising tide lifts all boats is what I, I, I look at that as. Now that making that extra lactose is expensive and we're not really being paid a lot for that lactose. So I don't really like doing that, but, but I'm willing to put that expense into the lactose if I'm getting the extra fat and protein yield, right? So part of the reason we, we get into this is that lactose and protein synthesis are very tightly connected. So just to go a little bit farther into the physiology, the enzyme that makes lactose, that is actually also one of the whey proteins, right? So there's very, very tight regulation. It's very hard to disconnect those two. Uh, milk fat has more differential lactation regulation from lactose. So we're gonna see more variation and I'll show that coming up. Long-term, hopefully we can disconnect lactose synthesis from fat and protein synthesis. And if you think about the early Jersey breeders did exactly this, they bred for higher fat and protein concentrations. Um, so they were disconnecting protein synthesis from lactose synthesis. And that has to be at a very basic level as far as turning, turning those genes on, right? So let's take this assembly line uh, uh, analogy a little bit further in. So how are these assembly lines regulated? Well, we have to make the machines for the assembly line, right? The machines are the enzymes. So we have to increase expression of those genes. We have to make the genes into proteins. We make the machines, okay? The next thing we do is so we can regulate those machines. So now we can turn those machines up and down, turn them on and off a little bit, right? Not entirely, but we have, have some impact there. And then the next thing to think about is the machines need substrate to work, right? They don't make milk fat out of thin air. They need acetate to do that to make protein, milk protein. They need amino acids, right? So we do need to feed in the substrate. So these factories need nutrients to make milk components, but the number and activity of the enzymes in the factory is highly regulated by hormones and other physiological regulators, right? So we have to be thinking about as nutritionists, not only do we need to give the nutrients, but we also need to think about how do we make sure that the signals are there to tell the mammary gland to be active. Uh, so what does this mean? Optimizing milk, fat, and protein is not just about supplying the perfect amount of nutrients. That's kind of the, our old idea in nutrition was that we balance requirements with, with the diet. And as long as they're exactly equal, we've met those requirements. We do need to do that, but then we also need to, to think about other things. So we can limit the factory through poor nutrition. Some nutrients are also regulators but it's harder to push the system. So an example of these regulators would be some of those amino acids activate a system called mTOR that can increase milk protein synthesis a, a little bit, right? So we need to think broadly about the many other factors that are impacting our, our factory. So the, the, the last analogy I wanna, wanna give here is when I'm teaching, I always like to, to talk about a, a bodybuilder, right? So if I wanted to become a, a bodybuilder like Arnold Schwarzenegger back in his Terminator days, 
how, how do I do that? Could I go to GNC and get the biggest container of whey protein that they sell and eat that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a few steaks in between? And then since I'm eating so much protein, I must, I, I, I'm going to have to grow muscle, right? Because I'm eating protein and, and muscle is, is made out of protein. Well, we all know that doesn't work, right? So what do we have to do? We have to go to the gym and lift weights. And that sends a signal to our muscles that they're too wimpy for the work that needs to be done and that they should get bigger. Now, if you were not eating uh, any protein, your muscle, again, can't grow from thin air. You need to supply the protein to do that. But you need both that signal and the nutrient, right? So we need to think about as that as nutritionists. We're not just supplying the groceries we're also having an impact on the regulation of the system. So now let's look some at the variation that we see uh, be between herds. So this is a, a data set from almost 65,000 test days from almost 6,000 herds from the RMS database. And this is from 2021. And I think what's most, most so huge variation in fat percent and protein percent. Standard deviations 0.34 for fat, 0.15 for protein. Protein. So you can see we have twice as much variation in fat as protein. We look at the 10th to 90th, 3, 5 to 4, 3 versus 2, 9 to a 3, 3. So like I said before, it's harder to change protein because protein is more tightly regulated with lactose. So they're very connected together. Fat is, is, is quite connected but we still have a little bit more environmental nutrition variation. There is larger variation between cows within a herd, and this is 1,700 cows uh, from one of our field studies and just showing for milk protein that now our 10th is going from a 2.7 to a 3.5 um, for milk protein percent. If we look at protein yield, we actually have almost a doubling of milk protein yield from the 10th to 90th. What's going on there? You know, we, we can't double milk protein percent, again, because it's so tightly linked to lactose synthesis, but we can double protein yield because we can have cows so different in milk yield driven by changes across the lactation, genetic differences, a lot of other factors there, right? There's even larger variation in milk fat between cows within a herd. So here, 2.7 to a, to a four eight. So when I look at this variation, I see opportunity, right? So if we can go in and say, why is that cow at a 2.7? Maybe we can help her move up, right? So that is opportunity as nutritionists and consultants to actually actually have an impact. I mentioned that, that, that milk yield is really important because we have this coordinated regulation, right? So milk yield is a huge driver of milk um, protein and fat yield. So I'm showing uh, protein yield versus milk yield on the left, fat yield versus milk yield on the right. Now, this is not, uh, not correct statistically to do this because fat yield is milk yield times fat percent, right? So, so our axes are supposed to be independent and they're not here. But what this shows you is how much influence milk yield has on protein and fat yield. We look at the R squares, what, we, what I like to do is look at this comparison. The R squared is 0.92 for protein yield, 0.78 for fat yield. So though milk yield, just general lactation is a big driver of fat yield, it's not as big of a driver as for protein yield, right? So you can see how a lot of the opportunity to change protein yield is through changing lactation in general, um, because we have less ability to actually change uh, protein percent. But milk yield uh, has, has um, little effect on protein and fat concentration at the herd level. Uh, Lou Armitano always, always likes to warn me in, in conversations that uh, bulk tank averages are very different than individual cow data. It, right, because the bulk tank is a, a weighted average because that cow that's making more milk is putting more milk in that tank and it's diluting out that cow that's making making less milk, right? So so um, uh, when we when we look across our milk milk yields, this is this is uh, uh, herd level test day data, and then I'm going to show you the cow light level data coming up. If we look at milk fat percent by milk yield and milk protein by milk yield, you know, we, we have lines that look like they're going down, right? But there's a big 
big scatter here. Um, milk fat percent, uh, basically we're losing 0 0.02 units for every 10 pounds of milk yield. If we look at our R squared is 0 0.02. And our R squared on, on the right is 0.01 with milk protein percent in milk yield. So, so you know, we don't want to be making decisions based on 0.02 R squareds. What I'm showing this is sometimes I'll run into situations where people say, well, you know, my milk fat's a little bit low by making a lot of milk. I'm making 90, 95 pounds of milk. So it's okay that I'm losing a little bit of milk fat, and a little bit of milk, milk protein, right? So, okay, I, the, 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 the line is there, but that sh we don't need to have that happen, right? If it's only an R squared of 0.02, 2% of the variations be explained by milk yield. We don't have to give up fat and protein percents to drive milk yields, right? Um, I think in some of those situations, we have another problem going on and, and we can fix that problem and then we can get both fat and protein percents. So now here's the, the data on the cow level. So on the cow level, there is a much stronger relationship. So milk protein versus milk yield, R squared is 0.36. Um, um, milk protein percent versus days in milk, 0.31. If, if I showed you the data for milk fat, it would be very similar. Pretty strong relationship uh, with milk yield. And, and actually in some of these databases, relationships will be stronger with days in milk than than with milk yield. So again, our herd average, our herd data is going to be different than our individual cow data. And I think this is where we've kind of gotten ourselves into some mistakes because we look at individual cows and we see those early lactation cows have lower milk fat and protein. And then we say, well, a herd that's higher in milk yield is going to have lower milk fat and protein, but that's not, not necessarily so, right? So we're 0.02 on those relationships with um, herd level, 0 0.36, 0 0.31 with, with the cow level data. So take home message here is do not forget about milk flow. You can't give up much milk yield when you're seeking to increase fat and protein percents. This gets complicated. I'm showing this 3D surface because remember a change in milk fat for a high producing cow is going to give you a bigger change in yield than for a low producing cow. So that 50 pound cow, you increase milk fat 0.1, that's going to be less pounds of fat than that 100 pound cow that's increasing 0.1, right? So we, we, we need to be careful about that. To put the numbers to it, on the bottom right, we have if we go from a seven to a 7.1% uh, fat plus protein, if we're at 80 pounds, we go from 5.6 pounds to 5.68 pounds, right? So now how much would we have to increase milk yield to get that same increase in fat plus protein? Well, it's about 1.1 pounds, okay? Now our best would be if we can increase milk yield and increase components, and, and we can do that, right? A little bit harder, but we can do that. That's, that's where we wanna be targeting. But I, I would ask, you know, if you think about trying to increase milk protein 0.1 units, how hard is that versus increasing milk yield 1.1 pounds? Well, I think it's a lot easier to increase milk yield 1.1 pounds than increase protein 0.1 units, right? So when you go in to try to drive yield, we want to be thinking about both increasing milk yield without herding components um, versus increasing the, the percents. We can use both, both as opportunities. Uh, also, we can have both fat and protein percent and yield. So this goes back to that, that what I hear from people saying, oh, you know, protein's not as valuable, fat's valuable, I'm not going to care, care about protein. Well, you can have both. It's not that I have to pick one or, over the other, right? So this is going back to that database. This is uh, almost 6,000 herds looking at fat percent versus protein percent. And we see a positive R squared, actually, of 0.1. Not huge, but it's definitely showing that as we're feeding and managing cows for better milk protein, we get better milk fat at the same time. We're going to talk a little bit about the nutrition coming up. And I think there's things that that makes logical sense, that as we do a better job, we can do a better job for both of these, right? If we look at... Um, Protein pounds versus fat pounds, R squared is 0.86. Again, this isn't quite fair because both 
fat pounds and protein pounds is being driven by milk yield, right? But it just shows you how important milk yield is to driving components, uh, um, component yield. Okay, so what can we do to drive fat and protein yield by increasing milk yield? Well, it's kind of everything that a good farm does right, but it's really hard to get all of this going in the right direction at the same time, right? So, so this is in, in no specific order, but, it, but uh, first thing I have here is cow comfort and barn design. You know, having that cow have a comfortable place, nice barn, sand bedding goes, goes a long way. Optimal calving intervals, we need to keep that herd fresh. Good genetics, good herd health, good transition cow programs. Photo period management, I think we've kind of gotten away from that, but there's old data to show a nice milk yield, fat and protein yield response to long lighting with a dark period. Forage quality and energy intake, good silage management, good feed management. All those things that go into managing a herd well, managing nutrition well, and the reality is when all this is going well, it's really easy to balance a diet and look good, right? When these things are not going well, it's it's a really tough job. Okay, so now let's turn and talk about nutrition, about the differential regulation. So we said we had the shared regulation, we're driving lactose, and as long as we're not hurting fat and protein percent, we're we're getting the advantage of fat and protein yield, right? So that's turning lactation on in general. But now what if we want to differentially regulate fat and protein percents, right? So I look at this as nutritional and non-nutritional factors, non-nutritional factors, genetic season, time of the day, there's a change in composition across the day, stage of lactation, parity, milk flow. I'll show you a little bit of data on, on these. Um, and then nutritional factors, I view it as we can decrease milk fat by causing diet-induced milk fat depression. So that's the a lot of long list of things you can do to do upset the rumen, get altered rumen fermentation. You can increase milk fat a little bit by additional substrate. So acetate from good quality forages, fat supplementation, specifically palmitic acid has a bigger effect there. And then the protein side, we do need the amino acids to make milk protein. The essential amino acids also can have some regulatory effect, increased protein synthesis. But then we also have a big effect of energy supply. We don't exactly know how to tweak that, but starch level and probably uh, energy in general have an impact there. So to talk about some of these non-nutritional factors. So both fat and protein are highly heritable traits. Uh, so you'd expect that... Um, when you select for them, you're going to get a difference. So this is some data where they just took bulls and split them by quartile uh, for PTA for milk fat on the left or protein on the right and looked at the daughters. Well, it's not surprising. You have highly heritable trait. Uh, you're, you're going to get higher milk fat or higher milk protein. You know, the difference here, 0.4 uh, units of milk fat across the lactation, pretty considerable difference. Like we said, there's more variation between cows and a farm. A part of this is being driven by that genetic difference. The other thing just to point out here is that we do have a change across the lactation cycle. Peak lactation, cows have lower fat and protein percent. In later lactation, they have higher fat and protein percent. This is part of that regulation in the physiology. Whatever hormonal changes are going on, that cow is changing the regulation of lactose synthesis versus fat and protein synthesis. So what's the de genetic difference between herds? Uh, you know, I've gone back and forth to call this small versus large. So I just stopped and I changed the slide to say, what is the actual difference? So this is a uh, PTA for milk fat pounds on the left, fat percent on the right. And this is coming from 6,500 herds in the DRMS database in 2021. So the 10th and 90th is uh, thir 37 pounds for the PTA fat. That's the transmi transmitted genetic part. If we double that, we would get what's the actual the genetic difference within the herd. So I've doubled that to say there's 74 pounds across that lactation, 305 day lactation. If we look at milk fat percent, which I've calculated out, um, 10th and 90th is a, a 3705 to a 3769. So if we double that to get the genetic difference, that's a 0.122 to 
percentage unit uh, difference between those those farms. Now you might want to call this a small difference or a big difference. Like overall, I think the percentage difference is pretty small, uh, but it's economically important, right? Um, so so I think we we kind of want to keep this in mind. Um, is it worth knowing what the genetic potential of that farm is? Well, I don't think it's going to cost you much to figure that out because this data is available in our systems, right? So I think this is something that we could be looking at in, in using. But overall, relative to genetic difference between cows, not much between herds. And what it is, is everybody's kind of using a mixture of bulls and, and, and that's averaging out that we don't have a huge difference in, in selection between these herds. Genetic difference for milk protein, kind of similar. So 60 pounds, uh, 0.066 percentage unit difference. Not large, but remember, there's not a big difference in milk protein between our herds either. Actually, let me come back and actually point out. So, so what is, how's this difference relative to what we actually observe? If we look at 10th and 90th percentile for rolling herd average for these herds, it's 440 pounds, okay? So if 74 pounds of that's genetics, we have what, call it call it 20% of the difference between these herds is being explained by genetic difference. So that means 80% is nutrition management in environment, right? So lots of opportunity in our nutrition and consulting. The, uh, but there's a larger variation genetic potential between cows. So uh, this is showing expected breeding value 10th and 90th for milk protein percent um, is minus 0.11 to plus 0.16. Um, so that's a lot more variation that we're seeing between, between herds. But it's still not explaining a lot of the variation between these cows. On the right, I'm showing what their actual um, uh, test day averages were. But part of it we're seeing there is days in milk other other things going on that it could, could explain some of that variation. So uh, what I want to point about, out about genetics is that it's having an impact um, on us right now. So if we look at our, our milk markets, the, I'm showing Northeast milk market in blue and Florida milk market in, in orange over the past 20 years. And you can see since 2010, we've been on a linear increase in milk fat percent in the Northeast milk market. We're still predominantly Holsteins. We don't have a lot of crossbreds or jerseys coming in. That's why I like using Northeast milk market. Um, so you can, can see pretty considerable difference. We used to average 3.7. We're now averaging over 4.0. This is 12 month running average. Why is Florida not increasing? Well, it's not that they have a different selection program. I'm, I'm guessing their genetic potential is, is rather similar, but I think it demonstrates that we can limit cows by their environment, different diets, different, different heat stress, things like that. Um, so, that you, so the potential of that cow, the capacity of cow has been increasing, but we can limit her, right? Um, so what is explaining this? Well, I think probably a lot of things are explaining it, but a big part is genetic potential. So this is showing genetic potential for Holsteins by birth year. And since 2010, they've changed the selection indexes. We've increased genetic potential about 0.3 units or 156 pounds of milk fat uh, just in the past 10 years. Um, so I keep hearing this comment, people saying, um, that diet induced milk fat depression is not a problem anymore. And I have to say this, this, this always hurts a little bit because that's my expertise is milk fat depression. And I've thought that this could be a whole career that will never solve milk fat depression and it, because it is a really complex uh, issue, right? So is this true that we don't have milk fat depression anymore? Well, if we think about, about things, you know, have risk factors decreased? I, I think they have, right? We don't have really high fat distiller grains, don't have as much high moisture core. And I think, I think we have less risk factors. Maybe we all listened to Dr. Jenkins and we solved it. Well, I think we have learned a lot about it. And I think we've gotten a lot better staying away from, from the issues popping up. But if we selected cows for more resistance for milk fat depression, I think that's also true. But then the question is, are we missing diet-induced milk fat depression because we have not adequately adjusted to the new genetic potential? I think this is a big one. So when we average the 3.7, if you were at a 3.4, 
farmers got really upset. They had milk fat depression. Now we're averaging 4.0. So the question is, when you're at a 3.7 or 3.75, are you calling that milk fat depression? And are you getting really excited and, and trying to solve that problem? Well, we need to adjust in our mind. We should be expecting a 4.0, right? So I don't know, but I think we, we need to keep increasing our expectations. Same thing with for milk, well, for milk protein, we've been on a linear increase going all the way back to 2000. Um, jumps around a little bit, but we've been on that linear increase. We also need to be increasing our expectation for milk protein. Same story, we've been increasing the genetic potential for milk protein percent by those changes in our selection indexes. The other thing that I always like to mention is we can't forget about the seasonal rhythms. So this is, again, 20 years of data. Uh, we have uh, highest milk fat January 1, lowest July 1. Same for milk protein. It's about 0.2 units of milk fat, 0.2 units of, of um, milk protein. So we need to change our goal across the year also. So how do we feed for more milk protein? Well, first, we need to make sure we have adequate amino acids being absorbed. Uh, we do that through a healthy rumen and amino acid balancing. We need to turn on protein synthesis in the mammary gland, right? So we think of us lifting weights to get bigger muscles. How do we tell the mammary gland to go ahead and start making more milk protein? Well, you don't exactly know. I call these energy signals. It's definitely hormonal involvement. Insulin and IGF system is a big part. There's also a mechanism for mTOR and that mTOR can be stimulated by energy systems, but also uh, um, uh, essential amino acids. So we need both. You can't simply push metabolism by adding more protein. We need to tell the mammary gland to make more milk protein and we need to provide the amino acids to do it. I wanted to quickly look at the new NASM equation. They have a prediction for milk protein yield based on essential amino acids, digestible energy, minus energy and metabolizable protein, digestible NDF, and then body weight. One challenge I have with this equation is they're predicting yield over a very broad range. So 400 to 1600 grams per day. And my guess to a large part, what they're doing is predicting milk yield. Because when you're predicting across that range, milk yield again is driving most of that difference. Um, so so it, it's not so much able for us to interpret what can change percents. So how do we get here? Maximizing rumen microbial protein yield should always be our first goal. Um, we get really good amino acids from those microbial protein. If it's a happy rumen, we have normal biohydrogenation. We have good fiber digestibility. We have good energy intake for the cow. That is our number one goal. Um, have the rumen working well and get the microbial protein. There's also a, an effect of hormones, and this is really well demonstrated by what's called the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp approach. So basically, they infuse insulin, increase insulin, they infuse glucose at the same time to maintain plasma glucose. And what they see when they do this is they get an increase in protein yield shown at the top here and protein percent at the bottom. So milk protein increased from 314 to 33 with insulin into a 347 with insulin plus casein. So there's an interaction. We need both the protein and the signal. Another experiment, just to show you how consistent this is, protein percent with water, 311. They give insulin, 314. They give casein alone, 315. They give casein plus insulin, they get a 344. So this means that you need the energy side right to get the maximal response to protein and amino acid balancing. We have to do both. If we're just giving amino acids and not worrying about energy in these signals, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We're not gonna get the response that we need. Uh, there's also a, another recent experiment looking at giving slow released insulin. And again, just demonstrated that insulin and these hormones are able to increase milk protein yield. So what's going to impact the energy signals? Uh, cow factors, energy balance, insulin sensitivity and responsiveness, that growth hormone IGF-1 axis, or these things are probably involved. Diet factors, fermentability of that diet to get more propionate room and environment, uh, feeding patterns, room and modifiers. We really don't have this worked out. We don't have the formula to tell you exactly how to do this, 
but these are things that would be logical to have a role there. Okay, so to kind of wrap this up, I think nutrition management is best practiced as the experiment in progress. First thing we need to do is accurately and precisely set our goals, account for seasonal effects, is a sample a day, daily average? What's the genetic potential of the herd? Is the problem across all cows or just the high group? We do have that days in milk effect when we start looking at individual cows. Maximizing milk fat yield, minimize milk fat depression. Basically make sure the rumen's running right. When milk fat's acceptable, we want to be able to have cheaper diets, get increased production, increased efficiency. We're going to include what we call dietary fact, risk factors. Uh, we also need good rumen fermentation to get us good acetate to support that milk fat production. We also need the, uh, an optimal amount of fat to provide the fatty acids needed to make that milk fat. Maximize milk protein yield. Again, we need the amino acids. Think about the rumen and then our amino acid balancing. We also need to optimize energy signal. But here we need to be a little bit careful because if we increase fermentability and energy density, we take a bit of a risk on reducing milk fat through milk fat depression. Monitor milk yield and milk fat percent over time and make sure the cows are responding and that you're making the right changes. So let's review. Rumen environment's critical to both fat and protein. Yield involves many interactions. Uh, focus on fat plus protein pounds, but beating the average percents. Small genetic differences between herds, larger within herds. Maximize microbial protein production, then amino acid balance. Keep in mind those energy signals. Minimize milk fat depression and get the acetate and the dietary fat the cow needs. And it's a constant experiment in progress. If you figure out the magic recipe, I'd love to know. Uh, my guess is there's not one magical recipe, but there's a lot of different ways to get this running right. You need to recognize the folks in the lab that, that do the hard work. And we've also benefited from funding both from USDA and industry and commodity boards. Thank you. And, and I'm happy to take, take questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Harvatine. Uh, before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief vid video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. With today's low milk prices and rising feed protein costs, now is the time to turn up the dial on rumen efficiency. NitroSure, Precision Release Nitrogen, is designed to help stabilize rumen ammonia pools by synchronizing carbohydrate and nitrogen availability to the microflora. Providing a consistent supply of ammonia is proven to increase rumen microbial populations, improve fiber and dry matter digestibility, and stimulate microbial protein yield, all leading to greater efficiencies in forage utilization and higher milk and milk component production. Maximize rumen microflora with NitroSure to turn up rumen efficiency and productivity. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Uh, Kevin, we've got several questions here. First one is, let's go with, uh, Sharon wants to know if there are any ways to manage the milk component variation between cows and the herd. Yeah, so um, part of that is you, we, we, we have to appreciate the days in milk effect, right? So, so I, I, maybe long-term we can figure out how to manage that. And maybe there's a way that we can manage that peak cow so that she doesn't give up so much fat and protein. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to do that, but I, I don't want to overly hurt her based on that physiology, right? That, that we shouldn't, we, we need to, we need to have a realistic expectation. But the other thing is that, especially on milk fat, there's some cows within a herd that are milk fat depressed while others are not. And you think about why that is. Well, they have different feeding behavior, um, different rumen functions, right? Different microbial populations. So, so I've often wondered, especially when milk fat's really valuable, if we could go in 
and identify those cows that are lower in milk fat because they had milk fat depression and then feed them differently because they just can't handle as much starch. Um, and, and we probably could have a diet that worked for them uh, better than, than the average herd diet. All right, very well. Next question comes in from Bertrand. Um, how does a rumen modifier such as sodium onensin uh, be able to mitigate the fat yield or, or milk fat percent and in which directions? Uh, yeah, so, so rumensin is a risk factor for milk fat depression. It, it'll, it'll put you at a higher risk for shifting into that trans 10, trans 10 pathway and, and decreasing milk fat. Um, so that, that can happen. Now, the other thing that things you can think about is that that doesn't happen every time. And in other situations, there's probably times where you can increase VFA yield with, with rumensin. And there would be such, some situations where that VFA yield would help your, your de novo synthesis. The other part is that um, you, if you're capturing more energy out of that diet and you're energy limiting and you're able to drive milk yield, you're probably going to drive fat and protein yield at the same time um, just, just through alleviating that, that energy deficit. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Bill's asking, is there a certain level of lower milk fat percent that you would consider to be unacceptable in a Holstein herd, irrespective of milk yield? In other words, is, is there a concern level for low milk protein percent? Uh, yeah. So, so I guess the, the one thing to quickly say there is I, some people would go through and count inversions, right? So how many cows are lower in fat than protein? I've never liked that idea because I don't, I, I don't want to discount a cow for having high milk protein, right? Um, you, you could, what, what I do like doing is going into the herd and looking at the high producing cows and looking at their milk fats. So those peak cows, we do expect their milk fats to be a little bit lower but they are also going to be the most susceptible to milk fat depression. So there's times where you can go in and sort out, say that the, the top 30% of the herd, and you'll see that they're averaging like a two five. Uh, and they should not be a two five, right? Even, even our peak cows should not be a two five. And you can identify that that small percentage of the cows has pretty severe milk fat depression and, and we need to fix that. So, so I think that's where I would go is, is kind of segregating out and you could also do flip it the other way. And if you sorted those low fat cows or low protein cows and start looking at them and seeing what, who are they and, and why, why are they low fat or protein? Okay, thank you. Uh, next question comes in from Piet. Uh, what's your advice on daily dose of rumen protected fat and which fatty acid profiles stimulate the most fat percent and or yield? Yeah, really, really tough question. We're, we're actually doing a series of experiments right now trying to, to figure out where is the optimal level for, for dietary fat. And the, the challenge with that is the, the cow can compensate by making fat through de novo synthesis, but she needs acetate that comes from fiber digestibility to do that. So I, what I'm expecting is that there is not one number for an optimal dietary fat supply, and that it, it's going to depend on your fiber digestibility and your VFA yield. So we've tried, in some experiments, we've tried to titrate down dietary fat to really low levels, and we saw no change in fat yield because the cow's able to compensate through that de novo synthesis. Other times we titrate down and we start, start losing fat. So I, I think what it comes to is kind of titrating it within, within herd, right? Um, so if you increase dietary fat and you don't get a response in milk fat, um, that means that she, she doesn't need more fat to make milk fat. Now that's not a total loss. She's going to use that fat for other things like body fat synthesis. But I, I don't think we're going to have a, a perfect number. Just on the fatty acid profile side, you know, palmitic acid gets you more milk fat 
than than other other fatty acids. So if you're looking to increase milk fat, um, palmitic acid's the way to go. Um, but on the other side, if you're looking for energy balance, if the cow's put, making more milk fat, that's less she's keeping for herself. So you you kind of have to decide what your goal is. All right, thank you. Uh, Wib would like to know what is the impact of parity on bulk tank component percent and individual cow yield? For example, a herd with thirty percent heifers versus a herd with fifty percent heifers. Yeah, great, great question. So, so, you know, on average, we expect our first lactation cows to make less milk. Um, their their lactation curves are different, right? They're they're more persistent. Um, I I would like to know more about parity and I don't want to make any uh, specific statements on exactly what's going to happen because what we've looked at, we've had different things happen in different places. So we've tried in some of our experiments where we are inducing milk fat depression, we, it, 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 one experiment, it looked like the first lactation cows were a little less susceptible to milk fat depression. Then we had another experiment where we weren't trying to cause milk fat depression, but the first parity cows uh, crashed in milk fat and had milk fat depression. So it, I, I, and I think what's happening is there's going to be interactions between that diet and her rumen volume. So if you think about she's lower intake, but she has a smaller rumen and uh, the rumen dynamics are really going to change. So it's going to change her susceptibility for, for milk fat depression. Um, I, I guess I don't I don't have a exact numbers for you. We need to do some some better characterizations of that. Um, it's kind of been on the to do list, but we we haven't got that done. All right, very well. Uh, Luca would like to know: Do you have any any experience on managing milk fat depression and low protein percent in automatic milking systems, especially for high yielding uh, herds? I, I don't have any any personal experience. Um, I, I would just say, you know, with with robotic milking, we basically are going back to component feeding. Right. Uh, so we we have some uh, real important things to keep in mind there as far as how much grain that cow's getting in in the robot and um how many times today she's she's getting that? So I think there there's definitely an increased risk for milk fat depression when we start slugging in in grain in that situation. Um, that I, that's on the milk fat side. I I I really don't have any experience on the milk protein side for those robots. I I'd almost think that that protein would not be as much of an issue, but there might be something I'm not thinking about there. All right. I've got another question from Piet. Uh, what's your opinion on rumen protected amino acids? Uh, which ones? And do you have an opinion on daily dose? Yeah. Um, so, so here I, I'm probably going to pull the academic card that I'm, I'm an expert on the milk fat side. So I, I, I don't have to have an opinion on, on the amino acid balancing <laughs> side. Um, so what, what I just say generally is uh, you know, there, there's some really nice responses demonstrated to amino acid balancing. You, you have to get things right. Um, some of that variation in response, I think, is probably because we're overlooking the energy side. And just like the insulin clamp data showed, you, you have to have both. You, you just can't have the amino acids. You have to have the rest of the diet working well to, to get that, that response. Um, you know, I, I, I know there's a lot of different products out there. Um, they, they, they differ in, in their costs. They differ in rumen protection and intestinal digestibility. Um, I, I think that's something you just have to work through to figure out what makes sense for the market you're, you're working in. Mm -hmm. Marcus would like to know what is the best way to get more energy in high producing group of cows? And he's referencing milk protein signal uh, and insulin. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm biased in this, but I, I still believe we're feeding a ruminant. So I, 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 I love feeding higher quality forage. Right. Um, so I, I think that should always be our first choice is to be able to improve fiber digestibility. Um, uh, 
as number one, right? Um, in I know that's that's not always possible, and and you have the bunk of of silage that that you have to feed. This is really really the balancing act, right? So we we start bringing in starch to increase energy density. We want to kind of have moderately available rates of starch. Um, so that we don't overrun run the rumen and cause milk fat depression. But this this is why I don't think we're ever going to solve milk fat depression because as we're trying to feed for more energy, we're just inherently increasing that risk for milk fat depression. So it's always the balancing act. Um, and, and the safest approach on that balancing act is through better quality forages. All right. The next question comes in from Seba. Um, can you talk about uh, insulin's role in increasing milk protein synthesis in the mammary gland? Yeah. So, so it, it, it interesting story there because the mammary gland doesn't have insulin receptors it, it, itself. Um, but what the me the mechanism that was proposed through through the uh, whole series of experiments that were done, um, really in the the 90s up, up until about 2000 is they proposed that insulin in the liver was increasing the amount of IGF that was being produced. So remember we have our growth hormone IGF axis, that growth hormones hitting the liver and it's telling the liver to make more IGF-1 if it has enough energy to do so. So insulin is a signal there that stimulates IGF-1. IGF-1 is going to the mammary gland in telling the mammary gland to make more, more milk protein. So that, that was the most compelling mechanism that was shown at that point. Um, you know, there, there, there's likely other things going on, but the IGF-1 system was, was a uh, really compelling mechanism. Hmm. Uh, we've got a question from someone you referenced today in, in your talk. Uh, Dr. Jenkins would like to know, how well, first he says, well done. <laughs> and then he says, can you tell from the variation in rumen CLA, and he, in parentheses, I assume milk CLA is of little help, uh, how much of the variation in milk fat it explains within the herd? Yeah, so we, we did one field study where we we had 1,700 cows, we had rumination observation systems on those cows, and we got milk fats, and we went in trying to, ex to do multiple regression to say how much of the variation can we explain by rumination behavior, how much can we explain by trans 10 18 ones. so trans 10 18 ones are best, best marker in, in milk fat. Um, and, and I have to say, it, it was rather disappointing that what we found in the multiple regression is that it was significant, uh, but the a portion of the variation it explained was, was not all that big. But when we built the multiple regression, basically you had a bunch of things that each explained a small amount of, of the variation. Um, I think part, part of that and that's even when we start putting genetic factors and things like that, that in there. Um, so it, in that data set, it wasn't as much as what I had hoped based on the biology that, that, that we understand. But I think when we back up, if we, if we can control for all these other things, we see those significant effects, but on farm, um, it, it's a lot of different factors are important. All right. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour. Uh, do you have a hard stop? Uh, we've still got several nope. questions. You can go on a little more. Yep. No, nope, I'm right. good. Very well. Next question is from Juan. Is there any difference between energy from fat or from starch at time to stimulate insulin secretion? Uh, could be the cause uh, of less percent protein with diets high in fat. Yeah, so there, there's definitely differences there. So, so in uh, even on the starch side, so remember, not all starch is the same. Um, so the starch is going to make propionate in the rumen, but how fast it makes propionate, how much propionate's made, is going to depend on that starch source and the rumen and the rumen microbes that are there. Um, fat is is definitely different in in um, insulin signaling for sure. Yeah, you know, there is some interest now. Um, some work coming out of Michigan State that's proposing that maybe oleic acid has some differential effects either on insulin signaling 
um, or on insulin insulin secretion. So even between individual fatty acids, there there's going to be be some differences. Uh, so it's interesting to think about both of those as being energy signals. Um, but I think when we get physiologically, they're they're probably working through different pathways. Um, now, if we think about that, insulin is stabilizing IGF secretion in the liver. Uh, fatty acids changing energy balance are also going to impact the liver and in that IGF IGF axis. I will say the one one comment on fat relative to milk protein is that there's a lot of worries in the 1980s that they were seeing small decreases in protein percent with fat supplementation, and. Uh, and for a while, there, there, there was a lot of discussion that fat was decreasing protein synthesis. But when you actually focused on protein yield, it didn't change protein yield. What, what um, fat was doing was increasing milk yield and diluting out that protein a little bit. So it's kind of an interesting differential regulation where it was stimulating lactose, but not stimulating the protein. Um, but it wasn't hurting the protein. All right. David would like to know, can you comment on the economics of palm fat supplementation and what estimates should be used for calculating a, a return on investment in terms of expected milk fat response? Yeah, I, I, I'll I use my academic university professor card card again, but I'll, I'll walk through what I uh, think you should be thinking about. So so if if you're feeding palmitic acid, Adam Locke has some nice meta analysis to to look at the response that you should expect. And if I remember the last numbers correctly, it's about 20%. So um, you know, for every 100 grams you're feeding, you're gonna get 20 grams of milk fat increase, right? So, so uh, on the direct return, that's that would be the numbers to be using. Now, um, the price for palmitic is going to be different in different places, and it's it's different today than it was last week. It it's very dynamic market, right? Um, but the one thing I, I always like to add there is that I'm not sure if it's fair to ask the the cow to pay for all of it um, just based on milk fat, right? So that is your direct return, but the the palmitic acid that's not put into milk fat is not lost, right? Um, she is, she's actually putting more than 20% into milk fat. She's, she's decreasing de novo a little bit. That's sparing nutrients that she can use to make more milk, um, to increase body weight gain or do other things, right? Um, so, so I always like to, to just caution that, that I, I understand the interest in saying, I have this direct return tomorrow that's that's milk fat, and I can see that. Uh, but we're, we're feeding fat for more reasons than just increasing milk fat, right? All right. Next question comes from Ruben. Uh, he's got two questions. What is your definition of milk fat depression? And then are specific CLAs behind the drops in milk fat of a few decimal points, uh, as you mentioned in your talk? Yeah, so... Uh, I, I remember Adam Locke being asked when he was a postdoc, what is milk? When do you have milk fat depression? And he hesitated and he said, and he said, and still, I think the best possible answer is you have milk fat depression when you think you have milk fat depression. <laughs> right? uh, so, so I, um, I like to be a little bit more specific in terms on this. So rather than just saying milk fat depression, I like to say biohydrogenation induced milk fat depression, which is caused by those bioactive fatty acids, right? So when when do we have that? Well, if I can look at trans 10 values, which is an expensive technique, um, I can tell you if you have milk fat depression and how much you have by that, right? Um, now, I would say it's very clear if a cow's dropped, I'm gonna say more than 0.3 percentage units, it's diet-induced milk fat depression. We, with fat supplementation, with acetate supplementation, we hardly ever see any change bigger than 0.3 units, right? So, so the small changes, you may or may not be, be milk fat depression, right? Uh, a big change has got to be at least some degree of milk fat depression. So now if you have a 0.2 unit decrease, 
how how do I know if it's milk fat d- depression? Well, the trans ten can tell you. Um, it, is it possible? Point two is a little bit of milk fat depression. I think it is because it's a it, it's a linear it's a linear effect when we've done infusions of the bioactive fatty acids. It's not that you need x amount and you fall off the cliff it's it's a linear response and and you also remember if we go back to to the the herd versus the cow uh when that herd goes from a 4.0 to a 3.8 it's not that every cow decreased 0.2 if you have the individual cow data you may find that 20 percent of those cows went from a 4.0 to a 2.0 with severe milk fat depression and the rest of the cows did nothing right uh, so that's where it's a little bit easier to diagnose at the herd level, because when you're getting milk fat depression, some cows are dropping a lot. All right. The next question comes in from Sebastian. Uh, glucose abdominal uh, abomasal infusion increases plasma insulin, but what are the recommendations to increase uh, insulin signal when with diet management? I think we've talked around this before, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a tough one because remember, we, we can abomasally infuse glucose in, in experiments, but we can't do that at the herd level. Um, we, we, have, we don't have a lot of bypass starch. Um, and then there's even some questions around when you do have bypass starch, how much of that makes it out of the gut, right? Because considerable amount of that glucose that's absorbed in the gut is used by the gut, never, never makes it to the blood. So um, I, I, I think our bigger impact, and this is where we, we don't have the answer, right? But the, it, our potential is increasing that rumen fermentation to drive propionate and then getting that insulin response through, through propionate. And just, I'm just thinking of back to a couple experiments that fed, you know, high and low starch or dry ground versus high moisture corn, they, they can get a difference in blood glucose and insulin by changing that either starch level or starch fermentability. All right. And our last question comes in from Piet. Uh, what's the optimal NDF values in a TMR for optimal fat yield? Yeah, I, I'm going to say that that varies too. And it's going to depend on your, your quality of your NDF, right? Um, so if you have more digestible NDF, you're going to need a little bit more of it to, to fill the room in and, and keep the room in functioning well. If you have poor quality NDF, you don't need as, as much. Um, so I, I don't think we can have one exact number. Um, and there's where we kind of need to titrate again. If you think your NDF's too high and you're losing out on milk yield, start titrating that down. And as you do that, watch your milk fats and make sure you don't lose milk fat. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of webinars will be very busy for the rest of October and November with four more webinars in the next two months. On October 11th, please join us as Melissa Rodriguez with IRI shares consumer expectations and how to meet their changing needs. Uh, Then on October 18th, you can access a special four-speaker mini-symposia held in conjunction with the Cornell Nutrition Conference. We welcome uh, Dr. Heather White, Dr. Mike Van Amberg, Dr. Barry Bradford, and Dr. Jose Santos to reveal new revelations in transition cow nutrition. Dr. Santos will then be back with us on November 1st to discuss the intersection between implications of peripartum Uh, nutrition, health, and reproduction. And finally, plan to join us on November 15th when we welcome back Dr. Temple Grandin to share insights into animal behavior and autism. Um, Visit uh, uh, balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Uh, Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform or visit balchem.com slash podcast. With more than 50 episodes, you can take a deeper dive into a wide range of topics. In the next few weeks, we'll be sharing a uh, special producer panel podcast, which actually we're going to be recording today at the uh, World Dairy Expo. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. If you want uh, a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your uh, address to anh.marketing 
at balchem.com, and we'll get that off to you as soon as possible. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Harvatine, thank you for joining us today.